This machine just called me an asshole. Over the years, Stephen King has had something of an interesting yet turbulent relationship with the live action adaptations of his stories. Some he has loved, some he has appreciated, some he hasn't liked, whereas others he's downright despised. So in 1986, King decided to take matters into his own hands and convert one of his own stories into live action format himself with the release of Maximum Overdrive, which, as the poster suggests, this time King is pulling the strings. Maximum Overdrive tells the story of machines coming to life and turning against the human race after a radiation storm in which a group of survivors hide out in a diner where evil trucks are awaiting the humans so they can imminently destroy them in which a young Emilio Estevez must lead a resistance and save the day. Yes indeed, Estevez has gone from evil trucks to mighty ducks in his very enjoyable career. But yeah, it must be said, this film is really crazy. Look, it's not meant to be taken seriously. It's meant to be tongue-in-cheek and just plain fun. And not to mention the fact that the movie also features a kick-ass rocking soundtrack by none other than ACDC themselves. Which, let's be honest, would make any movie that bit more awesome. So today we are going to 1980s it up once again, as we look into Stephen King's first and only major outing in the director's chair, in his movie that proves that trucks are evil. As we look into 10 things that you might not know about Maximum Overdrive, the only movie that features Killer Trucks and the Green Goblin, along with ACDC and Lisa Simpson. You know what? This movie is actually kind of weird. Number 10. Maximum Overdrive's Origin Maximum Overdrive is based on the Stephen King short story, Trucks. It was first published in 1973 in an issue of Cavalier magazine, and then published as a short story in his anthology book, The Night Shift. But by the time the mid-80s rocked up, King started to get tired of live adaptations of his stories and their inaccuracies to his original vision. So King stepped into the director's chair to convert trucks into maximum overdrive, so it could be done his way, and that the movie could be made to his exact vision. However, King has admitted that while making maximum overdrive, he was out of his mind on substances, which affected the movie's creative process and final result. Sadly, that result landed the movie a Razzie nomination, one for Emilio Estevez and the other one for King himself. Yeah, ouch. But regardless of its Razzie nominations, or its disappointing 17% on Rotten Tomatoes, Maximum Overdrive has become a cult classic for lovers of guilty pleasure cinema, along with those who just can't get enough of watching trucks and cars ruthlessly kill people. Number 9. King loves to put the movie down. Maximum Overdrive may have been Stephen King's attempt of making movies based on his work his way, but it also seems that King was also very aware of the negative backlash the movie got at the time. I just wanted someone to do Stephen King right. So rather than defend his movie, King oddly and bravely got on the bashing Maximum Overdrive bandwagon, as he too didn't seem to have any kind words in regard to the movie as he described it as, quote, unquote, a moron movie. And once asked why he hasn't directed another movie since, he simply replied, Watch Maximum Overdrive. Yikes. It seems that no one is more harsh to this movie than King himself. He also once said that it's the worst adaptation of one of his stories. Number eight. The main truck is modelled after the Green Goblin. When the trucks start their ruthless attack on the human race, the one that seems to take charge as the leader of the trucks is a black western star 48,000. And I'm guessing it was decided to give the villainous truck a face, to make it more haunting and relatable as an evil killer. So the face they went with is that of the Green Goblin from the Spider-Man comic books. Yep, that's right, the truck takes on the face of one of the web slingers most horrific foes. It is pretty random to say the least, but hey, the whole movie is random as hell. 
and this is still a better rendition of the Green Goblin than that nerdy kid in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. So how is the truck explained as having a face of the Green Goblin? By having it shown to be a Toy Store truck, of course. No doubt making Maximum Overdrive the only movie to feature a bloodthirsty Toy Store truck. Number 7. Maximum Overdrive was neighbouring buddies with Blue Velvet. Maximum Overdrive was being shot at the same time as the haunting David Lynch movie Blue Velvet, and both movies were being produced by, at that time, major Hollywood heavyweight Dino De Laurentiis, which meant that often the cast and crew of both movies would hang out behind the scenes. Now what an interesting sight that would have been back in the day. I would have loved to have seen Dennis Hopper and his weird mask thingy hanging out with the Green Goblin truck. Number 6. Maximum Overdrive was going to be produced by MGM. In the early days of Maximum Overdrive's production, the movie was to be produced and released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, otherwise known as MGM. However, producer Dino De Laurentiis had other plans, and so Maximum Overdrive was denied the presence of the Golden Roaring Lion as he decided to release the movie under his new production company, De Laurentiis Entertainment Group, a company formerly known as Embassy Pictures, which De Laurentiis brought. So with this new production company, Maximum Overdrive was released with a string of other movies to be released under this new production company, including Raw Deal, The My Little Pony Movie, The Transformers Movie, Manhunter, Blue Velvet, and Radioactive Dreams. And the company would go on to release many other classics, such as King Kong Lives and Evil Dead 2. However, in 1988, the company was going to release Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but the company sadly went broke and shut down. So, I guess the MGM lion had the final laugh after all. The irony being that Bill and Ted was going to be released by the Dino De Laurentiis Entertainment Group but was eventually released by Orion Pictures, which would end up getting owned by MGM, making the whole ordeal go full circle. Number 5. Simpsons Connections There are actually several things that connect Maximum Overdrive to The Simpsons. The most obvious connection is Yeardley Smith, who played a just-married bride in Maximum Overdrive who would also go on to provide the voice of Lisa Simpson in the once glorious but now tired animated sitcom. And to be honest, and I don't mean any offence, but I always found her character to be really annoying. Curtis, is he dead? I think she was intentionally meant to be irritating, but still, I can't help but feel like this character is the genesis of Lisa Simpson. Also, the movie is directly referenced in The Simpsons itself, in an episode called Maximum Homer Drive, in which Homer becomes a delivery truck driver, and after falling asleep at the wheel, discovers that the truck has an auto drive system, in which, just like the trucks in Maximum Overdrive, the truck can drive itself around. Number 4. Use of the Halloween 3 music it's here we cut to the infamous trailer, where Stephen King himself addresses us, the audience, and tells us about Maximum Overdrive, in which he talks about bringing one of his own stories to life with him at the director's chair. It was my first picture as a director, and you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. But if you listen carefully to the music playing in the background, you may notice something that sounds rather familiar. Hi. My name is Stephen King. I've written several motion pictures. To all of you out there who aren't horror movie gurus, that is indeed the John Carpenter composed music for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. You know, the Halloween movie that doesn't feature Michael Myers but instead killer Halloween masks. Now this isn't a rare practice. For example, the Robocop trailer used music from The Terminator, and the Goonies trailer used music from NeverEnding Story. But that said though, it's still pretty glorious seeing clips from Maximum Overdrive with Halloween 3 music playing in the background. <laughs> Seriously, I couldn't thank the editor of this trailer enough for this epic crossing of two obscure and underrated horror movie classics. Number 3. ACDC got involved because Stephen King is a fan. 
Yeah, that's right. Stephen King is indeed a fan of the most famous Aussie rock band of them all, ACDC. Upon meeting the band, King asked if they would be interested in providing the music for his movie about deadly trucks, to which the group agreed. Supposedly, King also suggested that the band also have a cameo in the movie, to which they declined, which I think is a shame. I would have loved to have seen ACDC take on some evil electrical appliances. I mean, heck, the group itself is even named after an electrical current. So it would have been fitting. So ACDC released the album, Who Made Who, which acted as the official soundtrack for Maximum Overdrive. It mainly featured songs from some of their other albums, such as Back in Black, with a few new songs that were written for Maximum Overdrive. Basically, if this ordeal has taught us anything, that is, we need more horror movies with ACDC soundtracks. Yeah. Number two, there is a somewhat remake. That's right, in the form of the 1997 made-for-TV movie Trucks. As mentioned, Maximum Overdrive is based on Stephen King's short story Trucks, and thus in 1997, this made-for-TV movie is another live adaptation of the same story as Maximum Overdrive. So that does kind of make it a remake, only it doesn't have the lovable 80s cheese of Maximum Overdrive, but instead replaces it with 1990s awkwardness. Like so many unsuccessful made-for-TV movies, Trucks came and went and didn't exactly leave an impact, as it's very much become a forgotten piece. I respect that Trucks was trying to take a more serious approach, but if Maximum Overdrive is anything to go by, sometimes it's just better to have carefree fun with your source material. Number 1. Stephen King wanted Bruce Springsteen to play the lead. In the early 80s, Bruce Springsteen was proving to be quite the musical talent, thanks to songs such as Born in the USA and Dancing in the Dark. King really wanted to have the singer and songwriter as the main lead to take on the trucks in the movie Maximum Overdrive. Now watching Springsteen wage war against trucks with machine guns all while ACDC plays in the background? Yeah, sign me up for that. That would have been glorious. However, producer Dino De Laurentiis didn't see the glory in that premise, as when King pitched the casting idea to the producer, he replied, Bruce who? It kind of reminds me of that story of when Dino De Laurentiis was producing the Flash Gordon movie, and when he was asked about having Queen do the music for that, his reply was, who are the Queens? But anyway, back on Maximum Overdrive, De Laurentiis already had his own ideas. He wanted Emilio Estevez, who was a rising star at the time, and was popular with the young crowd, thanks to starring in the teen movie, The Breakfast Club. And it's apparently here when Stephen King was told that he couldn't have Bruce Springsteen, but instead Emilio Estevez, that King lost interest in the movie and left him kind of sour, so to speak, over the whole ordeal. Well guys, that was my fueled up look into Maximum Overdrive. It may not be the smartest movie out there. It may not even be one of the finest Stephen King adaptations. But then again, is any Stephen King adaptation perfect? But what it is, is lots of fun, which over the years has caused people to not only love this movie, but also really celebrate it. So whatever substance Stephen King was affected by, or whatever bad mood he was in when he made this movie, he still must have done something right, as it's a movie that gets a lot of love. Anyway, I'm Minty, and that was my look into the day that horror went into overdrive. Yeah, that was the movie's tagline. See ya!